Welcome to lecture 16 entitled Gene Regulation. In our previous lecture, lecture 15, we looked at gene expression and how genes go from the DNA blueprint into an RNA molecule and then eventually into a functioning protein. That was through that transcription and translation model that we really sort of went in depth through. And now what we're going to see is that this model of going from DNA to RNA to protein is highly regulated. There are many steps in which you have to sort of regulate the environment that's going to express a gene. And we're going to look at this first by understanding a very basic introduction to gene regulation in this first flowchart entitled Introduction. So let's introduce some basic concepts of gene regulation. First and foremost, I think it's very obvious and very important that we understand that gene expression, which is everything that we did in our previous lecture, gene expression is highly regulated. So we're going to write regulated. This is a key theme of today, and we're going to prove this by looking at many different mechanisms of regulation. So what does regulation mean in terms of genetics, in terms of gene expression? Well, I think of it as two different ways. What we can imagine is the following scenarios. We're going to state that some genes, okay, so some genes will be, let's say, on, okay, will be in quotes on at some, in some cells, let's say, in some cells at some times, okay? So a lot of some here, but what do I mean by this? Well, what we understand, let's repeat this, some genes will be on at, in some cells at some times. Now, this basically means that they are, there are going to be genes that are going to be regulated. Some genes will have to be on at certain times for the, cell, for the certain cell, depending on what's necessary. Whereas, I think it's good to contrast this by looking at the fact that some genes, think of the opposite, you probably already know it, some genes will technically always be on, will always, always be on. We'll say on. And what we mean by on is simply being expressed. They're going to be transcribed, they're going to be translated, and they're going to turn into a functioning protein. Sometimes they'll be very regulated in this left side, and sometimes they'll just constantly be on. There are two very specific names for these types of genes that you should understand. The first name for this one, this is basically the focus of today's lecture series, is that these are called facultative genes. Facul, F-A-C-U-L-T-A-T-I-V-E, facultative genes. And these over here are called constitutive genes, okay? Constitutive or constitutive, I'm not actually 100% sure. Okay, so constitutive or constitutive genes. So, this basically means that in the facultative side of the story, we're going to have a very regulated, okay, there's there our word, our keyword of today is regulation, a very regulated transcription and translation process, TXN plus TSN, transcription and translation. Over here on this side of the story, we actually have what we can consider a constant stream of transcription and translation, TSN. So we have this sort of two sides of the story. We have some genes in some cells being on at some times, which are known as regulated facultative genes, and some are constantly on and constantly thus being transcribed and translated. These are also known as housekeeping genes. Think about it like this. You constantly are housekeeping in order to make sure that things in the house don't get dirty. The cell is constantly housekeeping because these genes that are housekeeping, constitutive genes, constantly need to be on so that the cell can be okay, so that the cell can live in an okay environment. You don't want to live in filth. You don't want to live in a mess. So you constantly are housekeeping. The cell does much of the same thing. Great sort of other name for constitutive, constitutive genes is housekeeping genes. So now I want to sort of further extend our knowledge by sort of probing you with this question. Why now is there a difference? Why the D-I-F-F? -F? Why the difference? Why does the cell have some that are on and some cells at some times and why are some always on? So, 
Very simply speaking, think about it like this. If you constantly have every single gene, and there are a lot of genes in us, always on, you are actually performing something that is really, really energetically inefficient, okay? So what I'm going to state is that it's energetically inefficient, meaning energetically not good, not favorable to express all genes at all times, okay? To express all genes at all times. This is not good. There's too much being going on. There's so much uh, possibility for havoc, for mutations, for all of this nonsense to happen. So it makes sense that you have to regulate the genes. Okay, Some will be on at all times because they're housekeeping. They're absolutely essential. But sometimes, depending on the environment, depending on what the cell needs, they're going to be off or on. It all depends on the regulata regulatory environment in which the cell is in. And we're going to see that in great detail when we focus Focus um, today most of the time on bacterial regulation. So we're going to actually start by focusing on bacterial gene regulation. So we're going to focus on bacterial gene regulation. I'll probably abbreviate gene regulation like this or as just GR, but specifically it's going to be at the TXN level, the transcription level. Basically, we're going to be looking at this arrow one more time, the story of DNA to RNA. Remember that central dogma? So you know how there's an arrow that goes from here, and this is known as transcription, right? TXN on top of this arrow. There are a lot of regulatory steps that we're going to be looking at, and a great, perfect example that I really enjoy teaching is by looking at something known as the LAC operon, okay? The LAC operon in bacteria, specifically E. coli, but we'll get to that. So in order to exemplify this bacterial gene regulation at the TXN, trans transcriptional level, let's focus on something known as the LAC operon in bacteria because we are, of course, looking at bacterial gene regulation to start off with. We'll get to eukaryotic because remember, bacteria are prokaryotic. A little bit later, it's good to establish the LAC operon first. So, what's the big deal behind the LAC operon? Well, two big guys in genetic regulation history, known as Jacob and Manot, I think they're French, these two, um, in 1961, so that's not relatively too long ago, um, were actually the first to demonstrate okay, gene regulation, first to demonstrate gene regulation in something known as E. coli. So we've heard of E. coli, of course, but let me give you a sort of a refresher. And specifically, this gene regulation that they focused on was the regulation of lactose metabolism. Okay, We'll get to that story in just a minute, what this means, but just keep this idea in mind. Right now, Jacob and Minot were the first to demonstrate gene regulation in a bacteria known as E. coli. E. coli needs to metabolize a sugar called lactose. Now, why would it need to do that? Well, let's look at a little bit of a backstory on E. coli. Now, remember, E. coli are bacteria. They are prokaryotic organisms, thus they will have the following orientation. They're actually, for the purposes of this lecture, going to be found in the human intestine. They're found in you and me, in the human intestine. They have this unique ability, and this is sort of going to tie in directly to gene regulation. They have this unique ability to what we call adjust, okay? Adjust. That sort of reminds me of regulate already to changes to changes in the chemical environment, in chem, E, and V, chemical environment. So they have this ability to adjust themselves. Kind of reminds me of this ability to turn on and turn off certain things like genes, right? And we're going to be seeing this in great detail as we move forward. Well, why would this ever be necessary? Let's imagine a very simple scenario. Imagine you as the host, let's say the host, drinks some, let's say, milk. And you probably have guessed that milk contains something like lactose, right? So the E. coli, because it's within us, needs to be able to digest milk. Needs to be able to digest whatever we are putting in it, digest milk. 
So there has to be a situation in which it can adjust its cellular, its transcriptional, its gene environment in order to express the necessary things to digest milk. Thus, there absolutely needs to be regulation in the E. coli. Let me get that out of the way. There needs to be REG for regulation because the E. coli sometimes will have milk, because sometimes we're going to drink milk, and sometimes we're not. So there needs to be a sort of situation in which the E. coli can turn on and turn off genes in order to digest milk. Now, the last thing we'll talk about in this introductory video are some terms that we're going to be using extensively throughout the E. coli, lacoperon, lactose metabolism story. These terms are as follows. We need to understand the term known as induction, okay? Induction can simply be defined as turning on gene expression, okay? Turning on, I'll say G-E-X for gene expression. See this idea right here of facultative genes? Basically turning on those genes that sometimes are on and sometimes are off because, of course, these constitutive genes are always on. They're not going to be induced for the most part. The ones that are going to be induced, the ones that are going to be undergoing induction of turning on are going to be the facultative genes. So in order to turn on gene expression, you use the term induction. I will try to induce lactose metabolism genes at the lac operon, which we'll understand in just a second. Another term we need to understand is known as the inducer. So, in order to have induction, you need an inducer, something that does or causes induction. This is simply defined as, and you probably can guess what the inducer of our E. coli lac operon situation is, a compound that stimulates, okay, that stimulates the synthesis of an enzyme. Metabolism is all about enzymes, right? It's all about catabolism and anabolism. Right now we're going to be breaking down things. So that's going to be catabolism. We're going to be breaking down the host drinking milk. So we need to be able to digest this milk. So we need to have an inducer that causes us to turn on and induce some genes necessary to digest lactose. And you've guessed it. The inducer in our situation is going to be what? This milk, right? And again, this milk is coming and changing the chemical environment known as the human intestine for the E. coli. Thus, the E. coli has to adjust and respond and regulate based off of what our inducer has just caused, induction. And lastly, last thing we'll talk about in this video is something known as an inducible enzyme. All of this is going to really be tied together when we actually get into what happens at the lac operon. It's really, really cool. The inducible enzyme is something that's coded for, okay, coded for by um, an inducible gene, by inducible gene, okay? So think of a gene that can be induced. In order for it to be induced, it's going to produce something. And that production is going to be an inducible enzyme, okay? It's going to produce, basically this is going to be coded for an inducible gene that eventually is produced in response, again, response, regulation, adjustment, all of these words are synonymous, in response to an inducer. So what happens is you drink milk, E. coli notices its environment has changed, so it's going to adjust its environment. It's going to have an inducible enzyme that's going to be coded for by an inducible gene because an inducer has just entered the environment, and thus the synthesis of an enzyme will be produced in response to an inducer. Be very comfortable utilizing these terms, much the same way I've just done. You'll get much better at it as we look at the story of the lac operon in much greater detail as we move forward.